Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Samira Tilly, Marketing Manager at Assemble Systems. Our webinar today will cover how Lee Scratcher Lewis adopts new construction software and technologies effectively. Now let's get started. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Tim Kelly, Director of Partnerships at Assemble, and Lana Gokanauer from Lee Scratcher Lewis, VDC Manager. Go ahead, Tim. Thank you, Samira. So to start off, as we always do, I'm going to cover a brief agenda. Um, today we'll go through some quick intros, uh, both of, of myself and of Lana and Assemble and uh, Lee Scratcher Lewis. And then I'm going to turn it over completely to Lana to step through their evaluation process and some uh, content they've put together on uh, what they typically do in um, selecting software. And then we'll move into a Q&A session. So a little bit about myself, I've been with Assemble uh, for a few years now as a product manager and now director of our partnership program. And um, prior to that, I come from a general contractor where I spent uh, quite a bit of time in both pre-construction and in construction, uh, managing the VDC efforts across um, large um, education and aviation projects. Um, Lana, why don't you go ahead and intro yourself? Hi, I'm Lana Gockenauer, and as was noted, I'm the Virtual Design and Construction Manager at Beach Crutcher Lewis, and I've been here for about six years. I've been using Autodesk products um, since AutoCAD was in DOS, and Revit specifically since about 2008, Navisworks when it was acquired by Autodesk. Um, I've been a certified Autodesk instructor in my past life. Uh, currently, I do work with local uh, colleges to help them on their curriculum so that they do include them. I'm also the Vice President of the Seattle Reddit Users Group. We are one of the largest Reddit Users Groups in the country with almost 1,100 users. So you can go on YouTube and see what we've been presenting. And I'm also active on Twitter, so if you want to follow me there, it's just Lana G A E C. Okay, thanks, Lana. <laughs> yeah, so um, just a little bit about Assemble. Um, Assemble, if you're unaware, is a web-based platform that allows you to uh, what we like to say is unlock the power of your model data and content. Um, so um, in just a few short words, Assemble allows you to aggregate model information along with drawings and point clouds into an environment that is uh, collaborative across the cloud. Um, so through a simple web browser, you um, access the information. You have the ability to condition it or organize it the way you see fit or needed for the particular task at hand. Uh, you can connect that to other data sets, such as estimating or scheduling information, or push it out to your project management systems or bid environments, and um, ultimately dive into particular analysis on um, whatever is um, in, in whether you're evaluating changes during design or changes during construction, or in general, the model information at large. Uh, you have that ability to dive in and create uh, customized reports across your uh, model information. So, Lana, why don't you go ahead and give us a, a brief introduction of uh, Lee Crutcher Lewis? Well, thanks. Um, so, Lee Crutcher Lewis, we're 132 years old. We have two offices. One is in Portland, Oregon, and the one where I am at in Seattle, Washington. Seattle happens to be one of the fastest growing uh, cities in the United States, and we still have the most pilot cranes in the air. So Lee Scratcher Lewis, uh, we have about $1.2 billion in pre-construction. Our 2016 revenue was about $500 million. But the most amazing statistic that we like is that 80% of our clients are return clients. You know, we all know that construction is one of the most wasteful industries in the world, and we want to make it better. And I believe that if we use targeted technology, we can make construction less wasteful thus making us better stewards of the planet. This means, at least question Lewis, we do things differently. In fact, we do things so differently here. We've just been um, profiled in the new book, Building Lean, Building BIM, by Raphael Sachs. He's also the co-author of the BIM Handbook. And his co-author of this new book is Ronan Barrett. We are the only American company that was profiled in this book. And it uh, highlights our process that we use to reduce RFIs in our projects, sometimes by 90%. And it also highlights a project we did that the kitchen TI, that we had no rework, and we opened the kitchen on time. 
So let me tell you a little story here. When I was talking with Assemble about this, um, you feel like you're being sold software, right? So they asked me to do this, and I started thinking about, about software salesmen in particular, um, and how they show up and they go, hey, look at this bright, new, shiny software I have, and if you pay another $5,000, it'll make coffee for you. Okay, hey, that's an exaggeration, but <laughs> they, they, they don't come in and they don't talk to you about your pinch points, and they don't understand that I drink tea, not coffee. So um, I was looking around for the presentation for an image to, to show this, and I found this one from Colorado Casters. And I'm going to quote to you from the comments um, from the blog owner here. And I quote, whoa, stop the orders, folks. This is a spoof ad and not a real product. Schmackety schmackety wah wah is merely a figment of my imagination. Please stop sending us checks. How did you even get our P.O. box number? Some folks will buy anything, I guess, end quote. And that's how I feel sometimes about software. You know, this is not how Lewis works. We just don't buy the new shiny software. And I am pretty hard on salespeople. I mean, I'm really hard on salespeople. And I don't want the bright new shiny software. I want the software that makes my job easier and saves us money. And what it seems like is most software companies, they want to get in and they want to control your means and methods. They're not actually partnering with you. They're more dictating to you. And then when I go to their website, I get these big, grandiose, overarching messages of we can save you 5,000% in one month if you use this product. And then I can't even find a fee structure. And that's a problem for me also. So at this point, I have to give a shout out to my salesperson. Her name's Abigail Curtis. Now, mind you, I don't go easy on any salesperson. I went a little easier on Abigail because she and I had actually worked together at a company when, uh, in California. But Abigail did exactly what I needed her to do. She listened. And then when she heard my pinch point and she heard my issues, she didn't sell me software. Abigail sold me a solution. So we do have parameters that we set up when we look at software, when we're, we're evaluating our software, first, it must fit us, not the other way around. But we also have some other things that we look at here. Like I said previously, it must solve a problem, an issue, or a pinch point. Two, it must be easy to use. It must lean out an existing process, and by leaning out that process, we will create ROI. So the only bright and shiny thing I like is the marriage of experience and technology. We're really good builders, but how do we build better with technology? So when Abigail heard my problem, she said, she said absolutely, Assemble will solve this. So what was the problem I presented to Abigail? It's my case study. I've done two of these case studies. The first one is called I Hate Curtain Walls, and the second one is called I Still Hate Curtain Walls. <laughs> Mind you, in Revit, curtain walls are perfect for architects. They do exactly what the architect needs, and they give them their design, and it works exactly as it's designed to do. It's just not great when it comes to quantity takeoff. In fact, this project here, I was anywhere between 4% and 20% in variation in either direction. The situation is, when architects make this, they may have a yes-no parameter that turns on glazing, vision glass, or turns on spandrel. Or it has a yes-no parameter that turns on a louver versus your vision glass versus your spandrel. There's times you go in and you go for the system panel and the doors won't show up. You know, I can continue on. That's why I wrote four pages of this. It just doesn't capture everything we need to do, even if we go after materials. So I told Abigail this problem that we're having, and then I asked to remodel the exterior skin when I want to do an estimate for this. So she's like, I've got the solution for you. It's a symbol. And it solved that problem nicely. What it did for us, she gave me the trial, and I went in, and I put the same model. Now, this, is a, this building is on a super block, and I've never been able to capture a quantity that was 
viable. I have 168,000 square feet of curtain wall to 220,000 square feet of curtain wall, kind of you know all over the board there. I drop it into assemble and in seconds, I'm not kidding you, within seconds, I knew I had 199,207 square feet of curtain wall. And I could colorize it to verify that I actually didn't capture that full surface area. I went down to my project manager and I said, what's the, what does the bid come in for our exterior skin curtain wall? Our bid came in at 200,000 square feet. That's a variation I can, I can handle with that. So at this point, it solved that problem or that issue, that pinch point that I had when it came to curtain wall and getting a really good number that I could back check on a bid. So the next thing is it has to be easy to use. So what you see on your screen right now are two ways of communicating. One's a little more complicated than the other. The one's a ham radio. Now, a ham radio, you have to take classes and you have to pass a test. And there's some interesting things with ham radio. My husband does this, and I hear him talking about bouncing his signal off satellites and, and things like this. And I'm like, wow, that's kind of complex. But I have an iPhone. When I open up my iPhone, like everyone else, there's no manual. We simply follow the instructions on the screen. And it makes it easy for us, and it's a very user-friendly element, kind of like our software. Revit is a very complex software. It takes, it takes years of learning to use Revit properly. It's a very um, beneficial software for a very specific thing. But then you have Assemble. I opened up Assemble, and it's so easy to use. Now, again, instead of call Abigail out on this one, I put her through the ringer. I feel really bad for her about putting her through the ringer on this one. Um, she said, obviously, I can solve this problem with her curtain wall. I will give you a trial. Why don't we set up a phone call with my tech, and we'll walk you through how to set up a project. And I said, no, that's not going to work for me. I need to know that I can use the software. I was a software trainer. I was a software tester. If I can't use your software, then how can my project engineers and my project managers and my superintendents find it easy to use? So Abigail capitulated. She says, you know what? Tell you what, I'll give you the trial as long as you set up with me in one week a meeting with my tech. And I was like, okay, that I can do. So that week, I ran assemble through its paces. I tried to break it. I put the biggest projects I knew in there. I just took it to task. So the week ended, and I had the phone call with the tech. It was a very productive conversation because over that week, I learned things about Assemble. And there's things that I was wondering, why can't it do this? Or why can't I find how it does this? Or why is this kind of clunky in my thought process? So the conversation was productive because I got answers to my questions. And then the tech could see what I knew, and then he could give me tips and tricks. So it was a super productive conversation with it. So we knew the software would work for us because obviously we don't work for the software, and it didn't change our means and methods. It was simply an added tool. So it was easy to use. So the third way here is leaning out an existing process. What you see here is a typical element we like to do. Uh, this was a building north of Seattle, and we took all of the different wall types, and we put them together um, into a schedule. From that schedule, we colorized the views, and from that colorized view, we sliced it into levels, and from there, we exported it to Excel. We do this because we get better numbers. When you look at this, there are some very small areas of wall in here, some very expensive areas of wall in here, but we got so much more information and better bids back from drywall contractors and interior partitions, and all of that information came back. This takes us hours, I mean, straight up hours to do this. But what we spend the hours on, what we get back, we had a great ROI as it was. So, assemble to the rescue on this. Here's that same tower. I put this into assemble, and I'm not kidding you. It took me 10 seconds to get what you see here. 
I put my stopwatch on my phone, clicked it, did what I needed to do, reached over, turned off stop, and it was at 10 seconds. Now, yes, I'm going to clean this up and I'm going to work on it. But it will not be hours of work. It will be minutes of work. You'll notice here I have 43 wall types identified and over 1,000 individual walls in this project. Assemble has done exactly what I needed it to do. It leaned out an existing working process. So now, even from leaning out, you can see I've already created ROI from hours to minutes on a standard process. I've been able to access information that has been hidden, normally hidden to me, or, or difficult to access inside of my authoring software. So now let's move on to four more specifically. For the company, I wrote a value proposition. I ran it through its paces. I gave it to my new PEs just out of college. I gave them five minutes on how to use it, and I asked them, can you identify your scope inside of the model, inside of the sample? Every single one of them could. I have a project manager who's new to the company and new to using models. He loves assemble. He can see assemble and see the elements inside of it. I have been using assemble maybe two months now. I have 30 people in this software in one form or another. I have six jobs already in assemble. When I took the value proposition to the director of pre-construction and he saw the benefits and features of this, I had the software purchased within a week. So within the trial period that Abigail had given to me, before that trial ended, I had the PO to purchase the software because of how good it fits all four of our main criteria. Here's some highlights from that value proposition. Obviously, ease of use. This model compared with inventory colorization is fabulous. Seriously, guys. This, you can go into, and I can put two models together. It comes back with what's new, what's changed, what's deleted, and it gives me the quantities of this. Now, let me give you a cautionary tale here. We were at a meetup for the design technology leaders in Seattle, and I mentioned this to them, and every architect in the meeting just said, Stop, don't do that, please don't do that to us. <laughs> because they'll issue you a, a model on Friday, and they don't want you comparing it with the model the previous Friday. They're still working in there. They're still having their, their ideas, and they're formulating their ideas. And, and exterior skin can go up by 20% simply because of how they're modeling. And they're like, please don't look at this until we tell you it's a milestone. <laughs> so there's a cautionary tale right there. It's software and service. I, am, I only have to load in a uh, download for anyone using Revit to push it into Assemble. There's a nearly unlimited way of sorting the inventory or making a schedule inside of Assemble. It gathers information that is either impossible or quite difficult to get when you're using Revit in a traditional fashion. The limited model prep, you have to open up the model and publish it to Assemble. But what that allows you to do is verify that you're seeing exactly what you want to see. There are other FTP sites out there that you just upload the model to, and they grab one specific view. And if that view isn't viable, meaning people have a section box that's too small, or they only have a scope box, or anything along those lines, then when you open up that software, all you see is snow. That causes frustration in the end user. Why can't I see the model? Where is the model? But with Assemble, I will see what I'm publishing before they do, so I know they're going to see exactly what they need to, eliminating that frustration. And then this piece here, you might look at it to sync Assemble with Reddit parameters and go, I don't know what that means, and I don't know why I want to do that. What that means is my estimator, when he gets into the model, and mind you, he's Revit savvy but he can get into assemble and he can change data in there. Now don't panic, this is not something you want to worry about. My estimator gets in there and he sees that I might have coded a space function incorrectly. I may have set it back of house. And he's saying, no, that's corridor. And he can simply change that data parameter right inside of assemble. He doesn't have to go into Revit and do it again. 
he may also see that I've labeled something above grade versus it should be something below grade. He goes in and changes that, and I can sync it right with Reddit. There's no double processing going on here. There's no two softwares being open at the same time. So these are some of the values that we initially saw outside of this. So I'm going to have to move along here with the, uh, the interesting aspect of this is why you should use the model. Now, I went quickly over the last four, so I'm pretty sure you understood the four <laughs> propositions we made. Now I'm going to move on to the side of this with the human side of it. You'll hear people say, why should I use the model? So I've already told you why the software is really good, and I get this all the time. Well, why should I use the model? So here's the, your human side of software selection. That person who's usually asking me why they should bother with the model is usually the person who's standing there with an iPhone 8. They've driven to work in either an electric or a hybrid car, or their car or vehicle has that self-parking feature. So obviously this person is not technology adverse. But what they're really saying to you is, if I can't validate it, I don't want it. I don't understand it. I don't know. And that's exactly what they're coming at you with. Is, I don't know I can trust this. I don't know how you got to these numbers. I don't know. And you want to mitigate that, that feeling for them. So why should you use the model? Now granted, the ones on the one side are a little snarky. I get it. But now I get a little snarky when I hear this too. <laughs> but my first comment to them is, where do you think the 2D drawings came from? Now in Seattle, granted, we, we might be a little different than other portions of the country. A lot of our a lot of our architects will model inside of Reddit, and they're making their sheets right from that. So everything I see is already in Reddit. So it's there. Why not use it? And then I would look at them and go, Well, why not use the model? I want to know from them. Why don't you want to use the model? What is the situation? Because I can guarantee you, you can get more information, you can get better information, and you can get that information faster outside of that model. So that's kind of the, the, the interesting aspect of the human side of the software uh, selection. Now I do have to issue a cautionary tale with this, that just like hamburgers, not all models are equal. Now granted, if I have been out all day and it's 10.58 p.m. and I've not eaten all day, that squishy hamburger will do the job. But if it's Friday night and I'm going out after work, after work and I'm going to a gastro pub and I'm going to have a nice beer and that hamburger on the other side of it, that's what I'm looking for. But the point of that, I know exactly what I'm getting. And each of those, they have a point. They have a purpose. But with Assemble, I can tell which one of those hamburgers I'm getting. So here's an example. This is a model. It's actually a very good model. It's actually a really good example to show you here. This is directly from my senior estimator. He loves this feature. So this feature is he's clicked the wall in the 2D plan, and the wall has become visible in 3D. You're like, well, yeah, okay. He just loves this. It's a thing that he just turned on to. But you'll notice we have a model that architects do traditionally, and they'll put samples of, uh, of exteriors, or they'll put configurations of bathrooms, or they'll put things outside the building, right? Which makes a mess when you're trying to do an estimate from this. Well, we got into assemble. We saw that we had a hamburger that was good, but maybe it had, uh, you know, maybe there was a tomato on there, and we don't like tomatoes, so we wanted to scratch the tomato off, right? So we went in there, and we could very quickly find out that that wall type was used inside of the model, not just outside the model. But using assemble, we found that very quickly, we can hide the elements that we don't need to see. We could x-ray the building so we could actually see inside of the building versus having to cut sections and look at floor plans and other methods that we would traditionally do. So again, we're leaning out our process, which creates ROI for us. And I was able to put in here a parameter that I pushed back into Reddit. I put a do not use, a DNU in the comment section of it. So very quickly, we could see that outside the building, or DNU as a comment, 
meant the estimator understood not to use those walls because they weren't actually inside the building. This is an interesting one here also. We had already priced this project and we wanted to test a symbol. And that's what we want to do. We want to make sure this works for us how we work. The senior estimator himself put this in and called me over. He said, I want you to see this. And he had assemble on one screen and he had stage on the other. Now I know assemble has that capability to put these together, but again, at that point we hadn't even been using this one month. He calls me over and we look at the numbers between assemble and his takeoff. And most of them, more than 60% of them, were exactly the same number. So his manual takeoff and the model, why you should use the model, <laughs> were nearly exact. In fact, there was a point in the, in the foundations here that he told me he understood the footings actually got smaller and they turned on 90 degree, which meant his math probably didn't capture exactly, but we're not talking anything catastrophic. He looks at the assembly number and goes, that, that's a better number. I'm going to you know, plug that into my, into my uh, stage takeoff next time we go through. But that's just pretty, uh, pretty interesting um, to realize that in a very quick time frame, I have a lot of people coming over to me asking, can I have a symbol? Can I look at the model? Can I see the model? And they don't come back and ask me how to use it. We previously used to have a training session called Revit 101 for just project engineers and project managers, superintendents that they wanted to join us, just how to use Revit. Here, all I have to do is sign them in to assemble and give them a quick tutorial, less than five minutes. So wrapping up, why does our estimator use the model? Well, our estimator uses the model because he can easily organize the information. He loves that quick review between 2D and 3D. That filtering of data, so we can very quickly look at that and go, oh, those wall types are still outside the building. We really don't want to use them. Let me add a comment and think it in inside of assemble, then we can sync that up with Revit. We can compare budget models. So I can compare my SD budget with my DD budget with my IGMP and my FGMP. So the initial guaranteed maximum price and the final maximum price. We can compare all four of those and we can show the owner the progression and the changes that have occurred as to why the price is either going up or has stayed the same or, you know, information. There's no such thing as too much information. It's just how you aggregate that information. And then that federal, federated model inventory. I absolutely love the fact that I can put all of my trade models, my architect's model, my model as a general contractor, and the structural engineer's model all in there. And then I can run an inventory, and I can sort the inventory by the Revit category, and then I can sort that by the model it lives in. So I can start comparing information back and forth. The one that I left out, that known pricing structure, is very important to us. Again, we have a lot of work in pre-construction. And when we're putting a budget together, we have to know how much technology is going to cost us. And currently, there are a lot of software companies out there that go, well, tell me, how much is your project worth? Well, tell me, how many people are going to be on your project? And I'm going, I don't know. I'm in DB, by development right now. I can tell you it might be 30 million. They might get more funding for 50 million. Now the price changes. I don't know how many trade people I'm going to have in this thing. Why are you causing me pain? <laughs> right? Pinch points, right? Assemble wasn't that way. Abigail said, here's your baseline price. Here's how many people it will be, no matter their email address. And I went, thank you. Now I can put that number in the budget, or I know that what our overhead is going to be. And it was absolutely amazing. So as you see, Assemble, not only did it hit together four, those, those four basic aspects that I showed you that we look for in software, it also worked on the human side of selection of software. Because no matter what software you pick and you hand to somebody, if they don't pick it up and use it, it's useless. Assemble hasn't been useless to us at all. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how much more we can use Assemble and using the other features that are available to us in Assemble. So I'm going to turn it back to Tim. Thanks, Lana. That was awesome. I think um, what you were describing there at the end is not, you know, too much information is not a bad thing, just how you aggregate it and organize it. I think as a philosophy, that's kind of something we've carried from the very beginning that 
the ability to jump in those, you know, in between stages and understand if it's going up by 20% or down, even if it's in their thought process, that's a great thing to see and understand and be clued in on uh, because you can certainly weigh in and, and um, you know, from the contractor standpoint, contribute um, lots of meaningful information during that time. So all, all said, thank you so much for um, kind of sharing your story and how you use software and, and the benefits you're getting out of Assemble today. Uh, we really appreciate it, and um, we really appreciate you sharing your story.